G'day there, this video was originally 40 minutes long so I've decided to chop it up. Here's part one on investing in co-living spaces and registered rooming houses. Well g'day there guys, my name's Philip Wong and I have recently established the Fire Investors Network which is an investors club and recently we had our first meeting on advanced residential property investing and this happened in August of 2021. Now a bit about this new network that I've established, well it's a facilitated meetup and discussion group. The network offers invested education and it sort of suits the sort of investor who wants a hands-on approach. Traditionally with financial planning in days of old, the financial planner would say hey you, I'm the professional, you're not so educated in this area, just give me all your money and I will manage it for you. And yeah, they did make money for their clients, but there's plenty of clients who are mm, uncomfortable with just handing so much power over to their financial planner, and they want a more hands-on approach. So that's what I hope that this network can provide peer learning and education, but bear in mind, we are not offering you financial planning, so please don't ask for it. Now, FIRE stands for Financial Independence, allowing you to retire early. Not everybody buys the RE. I personally, I'm a fern. I never want to retire because I really like my job. I like what I do. I like helping people. Now, everybody wants to learn about crypto. Uh, I can't arrange my crypto expert to talk about it this month, so just hodl on, not to the moon, but hodl on till next month because we'll be talking about crypto then. I'm going to give this speech on the first topic, which is advanced residential property, but note going forward, I don't want to be the focus of this group. I want to find experts in their field to come and talk. So if you've got something that you'd like to present, please come and pitch me. So what makes this sort of investing advanced? Well, basically we're not looking at the standard three or four bedroom house that are rented to a family. We're looking for something that's a little bit more than that. But before we go anywhere else, a few general warnings. We're gonna focus on the uh, Victorian and Australian jurisdictions more generally. Uh, there was somebody in Germany who was really interested in this, but um, those laws are a bit different in Germany and that will change what sort of opportunities are available to you. I'm gonna focus on factual information. So under the regulatory guidance provided by ASIC, there is factual information, there is general advice, and then there is specific advice where you're talking about your individual circumstances. Well, we're certainly going nowhere there, and I'm not even going to recommend anything to you, so I'm not even providing general advice. This is all factual information. It's education on how the system works. I am not recommending anything. Also be aware that these are mere introductions, so there could be a lot of missing details here. You would be nuts to rely on a YouTube video in order to invest a large sum of money. Go see a professional here, and if I provide any numbers, these are rubbery because I just wanna give you hypothetical examples to give you a gut feeling as to the volumes of money we're talking about here. Nothing here is exact. The numbers will vary. Hey there, this is Philip in editing mode, just letting you know that if you want these slides, you can download them. The link is in the description below. Topics I want to go through are co-living and registered rooming houses, NDIS, a special disability accommodation in Australia. I'll touch on aged care, then we'll have a look at a defence force housing, and of course the NRAS, which is the National Rent Affordability Scheme, which, well, we'll get to that. And there are a few other things that might have been suggested by the audience in, in the discussion. So basically, if you have a situation where you have four or more rooms that are rented to individuals who do not know each other, then you need to register with the government. It's known as a registered rooming house in the state of Victoria. If you go to Queensland, it's known as a boarding house. Uh, they used to be called bid setters, although that's a much older uh, language. Uh, and there are certain laws that registered rooming house operators must comply with. Now, oh, what are you doing, buddy? Now, if you ever see the word co-living batted around, just bear in mind that it means not a registered rooming house. So we're specifically talking about three or less rooms uh, rented individually. Size does matter also. So it is possible to have, say, 100 student accommodation rooms rented out individually, in which case you would be considered a class three construction, but 12 or fewer residents would be a class 1B construction. So Australia has the National Construction Code, and under this, Class 1 are regular domestic buildings. Class 1A is your standard family house. Class 1B, however, is for a boarding house, guest house, hostel, or some other uh, building that has an area less than 300 square metres. 
Class 2 is domestic apartments, I don't care because I'm talking about rented rooming houses. And Class 3 is, well, basically think of a hotel. And specifically, what we mean here is that under Class 1B, you would be expected to have one Disability Discrimination Act uh, compliant room. So in other words, a room that's appropriate for somebody in a wheelchair. You'd have to have an appropriate disabled toilet, a disabled shower, grab rails, ramps, all that business here. Now, please note that Disability Discrimination Act compliance does not mean NDIS compliance. We'll get to that later. A class three construction, look, basically think of all the things that you would expect in a hotel, fire sprinklers, exits, and that sort of commercial standard of construction. Now, if you are running a registered rooming house, you need to be aware that residents will have additional rights. So the law has some specific aspects that apply to renters, and there are additional protections that apply for residents of rooming houses. And this is basically to protect them because they're transient. You should also remember that there are also state government mandatory standards. You need to have at minimum one bathroom per 10 residents, although honestly, one bathroom and toilet per three would be much more sensible just from a commercial perspective. I mean, yeah, one per 10, that would be pretty dirty. I wouldn't run a place like that. Residents also get a lockable cupboard space for a pantry. They need to have individual locks on their doors and the bathrooms for privacy. You need to have smoke alarms that are wired with escape lighting and egress signs and just general habitability rules. I mean, if you wouldn't want to live there, then you shouldn't be renting it out, honestly. How do you go about registering a room house? Well, you need to register both with the state and your local municipality. In Victoria, that would be Consumer Affairs, and they conduct an inspection once a year, and the municipality will conduct a health inspection twice a year, and they're really focused on things such as, do you have hot water actually running to the taps? Are the power points actually running? Is there heating and cooling? You know, those sorts of appropriate things to make sure that you're not running a slum. And frankly, there's much more profit to be run in something that is dignified. People will pay for cleanliness. If you're looking at running a registered rooming house, there is also uh, advocacy groups out there. Tenancy terms usually run from one, six or 12 months, usually six or 12 months. Um, sometimes residents will stay for many, many years, but you should be aware it depends on the sort of registered rooming house you're offering. So think about who you're offering this to. The management fees, well, they can be quite high. Perhaps I've seen up to 20%, but at the lower end, I've seen cheaper managers who will do who will manage your day-to-day -day operations for you for a hundred dollars of listing fee per room rented and fifty dollars per room per month which frankly i think is quite affordable given the yield that you can make on registered rooming houses power internet gas water these can be included in the rent or they can be split it depends on the house rules i will show you exactly how to assess demand and supply in any given suburb in australia and you do that using flatmates.com.au but i'll do that in a separate video so if i've uploaded that video you'll find the link in the description below now, I also mentioned the type of residence. Um, people often think of student accommodation, which of course we have a lot of international students in Australia. So you'd wanna find a location that was right next to a university or somewhere in the city where there's a lot of education. You can also have a general audience where you're looking for professionals in their 20s. They're not married, they just need a room. Um, they just need somewhere that's dignified. So not necessarily students. Oftentimes I find that people are master students and they just stay because, well, the place is good. It's appropriate for their needs. But there's also a new set of co-living arrangements and, and rooming houses that focus on people who are retired. So these are often uh, elder women who are completely able-bodied. They don't need a nursing home or anything else like that, but their husband may have passed away and it's pretty lonely. So increasingly, there are houses that are constructed with two or three residents who would live, who would cohabitate. They all have their own lockable room with their own ensuite, but they'll have shared kitchen facilities. And this, I think, is a really interesting uh, target market. And you'd want to make sure that you're picking a market to go into, because if you have, say, an entire household of 20-year-olds who are playing video games, got lots of friends over, and generally being loud, well, if you were to put somebody in their 60s in that room, they might not appreciate their next door neighbor. Sadly, we've had a massive impact because of COVID. So many registered rooming houses in Australia have really focused in on the international student market, and of course, nobody is flying at the moment. So I have heard vacancy rates of 80%. Yeah, it's bad. 
So it depends on your target market. People running co-living spaces for the retired certainly haven't been impacted by COVID whatsoever, or a more general audience hasn't been impacted at all. But student accommodation, yeah, it's looking pretty grim. For the first time I find in Victoria, you can actually buy a registered rooming house, well, relatively cheap, given that land is always expensive. But, you know, two, three years ago, you just couldn't buy these things because they were just such great businesses. Whereas now, you could buy it, but you'd have to eat a couple of years of losses and potentially make a lot of money in the future when COVID, well, hopefully it blows over. The other thing you should be aware of in investing in this is bank valuation. Banks will generally see this as risky lending because it's something a little bit more unusual. Just be aware that bank finance might be a bit more difficult. Tips if you happen to run a registered rooming house. Make sure that you pick a place that's close to public transport. This is absolutely non-negotiable. Only half of your residents I find will actually have their own cars. So yeah, transport is crucial. Respect your residents' dignity and make sure that there is social cohesion in the house. And this is what I'm saying about like picking your target market and making sure that you respect them. Because unfortunately, we have seen operators banned from this industry because they're basically running a slum. We don't want that. And frankly, people will pay an addition. Remember, people are gonna pay you more if the place is dignified and clean. So keep it clean. You might want to have mail forwarding services because you'll often have people who are coming and going and also having a luggage lockup is incredibly helpful. Wi-Fi I find is more important than water supply. Honestly, if the water was to go off, maybe residents will complain, but if the Wi-Fi is slow, holy cow, they'll tell you. So make sure that you buy the fattest pipeline so you've got enough bandwidth. Security can also be an issue because you've got people who are coming and going all the time and they don't always lock the front door because they always assume it's somebody else's home. So yeah, lots of security lighting is helpful. And yeah, there's also a bit of a tragedy of the commons problem here where your power and water use can be very high. So you wanna have water saving facilities on the house, lots of insulation, solar cells, these sorts of things can help keep your running costs down. And it's also great for the environment. Well, thanks very much for watching part one all the way to the end. If you thought it was helpful, perhaps it'd be good if you could give this a like. Uh, part two will be released shortly. It will be in the card here or maybe in the description below. Uh, and there'll also be a playlist on YouTube. See you then.